On this Wednesday night, Canada's key interest rate keeps climbing. It reflects very unusual economic circumstances. The biggest hike in more than two decades with food prices set to soar. Excruciating video of the Uvalde school shooting. The kids are running! What police did and did not do, plus backlash to the leaked footage. It's going to be in our social media forever. Aiming to move the needle on COVID vaccine boosters, differing recommendations for different people. And remember New Coke or Colgate lasagna? Innovation creates what, what the future will be. Welcome to the Museum of Failure. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Mitu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. With inflation in this country at a 39-year high, there were signals this was coming. But today, the Bank of Canada still surprised most forecasters with the largest hike to its key interest rate in nearly 25 years. It's gone up a full percentage point to 2.5%. It's the biggest increase since August of 1998 and the fourth since March of this year. The change will have an immediate impact on all kinds of debt, including variable rate mortgages. Ann Gaviola has more on what every household needs to know about the rate hike and its impact in our top story tonight. Desperate times call for desperate measures. An increase of this magnitude in one meeting is very unusual. It reflects very unusual economic circumstances. It's been a big shock and um, a, a big change for me personally. The latest hike means $400 more in monthly mortgage payments compared to what was needed in January for this 30-year-old Toronto resident who got into the housing market during the pandemic. She's cutting back where she can. Dining out, uh, groceries as well is a big line item for me to see where I can cut back and maybe look for more savings. Um, aside from that, like non-essential travel. For a typical variable rate mortgage of 2.7% on a home priced at the national average of $711,000, the monthly mortgage payment of more than $2,800 increases to more than $3,100, a difference of nearly $325 extra per month. The central bank says steep, successive rate hikes are putting the squeeze on variable rate mortgages, which were wildly popular during the pandemic. Anyone with a variable rate has been stress tested at five and a quarter percent. So I'm confident that most households uh, will be able to still make their mortgage payments. Interest rates have already cooled the housing market. The end goal is taming the overall soaring cost of living by reducing economic demand and discouraging people and businesses from taking on more debt. We are increasing our policy rate quickly to prevent high inflation from becoming entrenched. If it does, it will be more painful for the economy and for Canadians to get inflation back down. The bank says the risk of not tackling inflation forcefully now is too great. But recessions have historically followed aggressive rate hikes to combat high inflation. The Bank of Canada has a very bad record for the so-called soft landing, where they get inflation back down to their target of 2%, but they avoid a recession. Uh, the success rate in the last 60 years in Canada is 0%. The next central bank rate decision is in early September, when the economic picture may look very different. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Canadians are already feeling the pinch of higher prices on just about everything and the cost of groceries will keep climbing. The global food supply is being impacted by weather, labour and geopolitics like Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And while the official numbers are expected next week, it's clear Canadians are paying more than they have in decades. Mike Drolet has more. Toronto's Kensington Market is known for its relaxed vibe. It's where we met Sebastian Churio, who as the grocery buyer for Supernatural Market, has seen a dramatic increase in messages from suppliers notifying him of price hikes. Wow, that's a lot of emails. That's a lot of emails. And that's making it increasingly difficult to stay chill. I have my phone with the notifications off because it's, it, it produces anxiety. You, you start to feel anxious, you're like, okay, if I keep this with me, I'll go crazy. At the end of the day, he says there's no getting around it. Groceries will keep getting more expensive. The price of milk, for one, has gone up 25% since January. For myself, I would uh, probably pay 400 a month. Now I'm going to 700 a month for that the family. Much? Yes, that much. It has increased. 
Food inflation, which measures how much more consumers are paying compared to a year ago, is at 10.4% in the U.S., the highest it's been in 40 years. In May, Canada was at 9.7%, which is expected to rise when new numbers are released next week. But the sweet spot for food inflation, in my view, is anywhere between 1.5 to 2.5%. So as you can imagine, at 9.7%, we're very far off. Consumers, it should come as no surprise, aren't happy about it, with many accusing corporations of profiteering. Actually, 68% of Canadians actually believe that greedflation exists, is that prices are inflated, not because of costs, just because companies are trying to make more money. But Charlebois says the reality is the big three, Sobeys, Metro and Loblaws, have thin margins. Revenues may have been higher during the pandemic, but profit margins remain steady between 2 and 4%. That will do little to soften the blow of grocery bills that are getting harder for Canadian families to stomach. Microlay Global News, Toronto. New numbers from Statistics Canada show how the rising cost of pretty much everything is changing the way Canadians are living. The data from the 2021 census shows fewer people are living in what used to be the norm, traditional single-family homes. Nearly one million households are now comprised of multiple generations of the same family or multiple families, or a family with additional people living with them, often a renter. 4.4 million Canadians are now living alone, the highest share on record. The fastest growing housing setup is roommates, unrelated people living together to share the high cost of housing, with the number of roommate households growing by 54% from 2001 to 2021. The Omicron BA5 subvariant is driving COVID-19's seventh wave, accelerating case counts, putting even more pressure on hospitals and emergency rooms right as summer travel heats up. Today, Newfoundland and Labrador said people age 50 and over will be able to get a second booster in one week, and Ontario opened up its eligibility for a fourth dose. While my call for arms remains the loudest for the most vulnerable in our communities, we've made the decision to expand the eligibility for second boosters to include Ontarians aged from 18 to 59 years of age. Starting tomorrow, Ontarians age 18 to 59 who've had their first booster at least five months ago or at least three months after a COVID-19 infection can get a second booster shot. Almost 90% of booster shots in Ontario were administered five or more months ago, while booster effectiveness starts to wane after four months. There is a patchwork of provincial recommendations and timelines, but as Jamie Morocco reports, the bottom line is if you are high risk, the advice is to go and get your next dose as soon as you can. Long lines to get a COVID-19 vaccine are a thing of the past. Now it's a struggle to get people on board with boosters, with just over half of eligible Canadians having received their third dose. There's no question about it. Between the second shot and the third one, that's where the rubber hits the road. Research suggests COVID's latest Omicron mutations, BA4 and 5, are four times more resistant to vaccine antibodies compared to their predecessor, BA2. And while pharmaceutical companies such as Moderna and Pfizer are working on formulas to target those strains, experts still encourage getting a third shot with the current mRNA vaccine. The main benefit is just from boosting. So boosting jacks up the antibodies, which protects against all of the variants, including BA5. The federal government recommends a booster nine months post your last shot, but it isn't a hard and fast rule. Some provinces now say five months is long enough. And if you are young and healthy and are hoping for a fourth dose, experts say the best defense is one that is timed. You want your highest protection from the vaccine, which is within the first few months after you get a dose to be at a time when virus is highest. Over the age of 50, living in long-term care or immunocompromised, doctors suggest booking a booster now. Good job, look at you. And if you've just had COVID, three months is how long you should wait to get another shot, but it doesn't mean you're in the clear. To get infected with BA1, you're well protected against BA1, except we don't have any BA1 anymore, right? Now you have to worry about BA5. Canadian scientists are tracking even newer strains, and while they can't be certain what COVID has in store, Vaccines, they say, are likely to play a role in our protection plan every year. Jamie Morocco, Global News, Toronto. 
One man has been charged in the alleged hack of Aaron O'Toole's conservative leadership campaign two years ago. The RCMP have charged Dion Awai with one count of mischief under the section of the criminal code dealing with obstructing or interfering with the lawful use of computer data. Aaron O'Toole's office had no comment, but at the time blamed Peter McKay's campaign for the breach. McKay tells Global News he has no personal knowledge of the matter, but understands a why was contracted by a company that had a contract with his campaign. McKay says his team would have no way of vetting a why. He's scheduled to appear in court in August. Thanks to a new court challenge, we may learn more about the Canadian government's decision to exempt the return of pipeline turbines from our country's sanctions against Russia. Gazprom, the Russian state-owned energy company, says the turbines are essential to the operation of the Nord Stream pipeline. But the Ukrainian World Congress is casting doubt on those claims. As Abigail Beeman reports, the Prime Minister is now defending the move as a difficult but necessary decision. Addressing turbine tension for the first time, the Prime Minister didn't speak to new legal action taken by the Ukrainian World Congress against the government, but he did defend his choice. Those sanctions are aimed not at our allies, but at Putin and his cronies. And that's exactly uh, why we took this difficult decision to be there for our allies. We're very grateful to Canada. Germany's ambassador to Canada tells Global News it wasn't an ask taken lightly and acknowledges there's no guarantee Russia won't just turn off the taps anyway. We don't know. We simply do not know. And that's, um, uh, I think, a very important point. Wednesday morning, Russian state-owned Gazprom tweeted it had no documents showing Siemens could get the turbine out of Canada. We do not want to give Russia and Putin the kind of excuse to say, oh, you brought it upon yourself that we will not honor our obligation to deliver gas anymore because you do not deliver the turbine. The new legal challenge against the Canadian government calls Russia's claim to need that turbine a disingenuous ploy. The application for judicial review challenges the reasonableness of the minister's uh, decision to allow for the exemption. Викликати представника Канади у нашій державі через абсолютно неприйнятний виняток. We really should be shaken by that reaction. Oral Braun says Zelensky's fierce rebuke of Canada is evidence of enormous frustration in reaction to a precedent-setting move. This is a very unfortunate crack in what should have been a unified system of keeping pressure up on Russia. Russia tested us and we failed. A complicated situation with diplomacy, energy, and war all on the line. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. New outrage in Uvalde, Texas tonight. Coming up, the uproar over a video of the school shooting leaked. Newly released surveillance video from inside a Texas elementary school seems to puncture the myth that a good guy with a gun is the best response to a mass shooting. As Jackson Prosco reports, the video shows heavily armed police officers milling in the hallways of Robb Elementary School while 19 children and two teachers were being massacred. And a warning, the sights and sounds in this story are disturbing. The leaked video shows the moment the gunman enters Robb Elementary. Seconds later, a child comes around the corner, sees the gun, and then runs as gunshots echo through the hallways. Less than three minutes later, the first police officers arrive. Almost immediately, they're pushed back by more heavy gunfire. For the next 20 minutes, heavily armed officers arrive and assemble in the hallway, but they never try to enter the classroom. One officer even stops to sanitize his hands and lean against a wall. Another 20 agonizing minutes pass as children inside the classroom call 911 begging for help before officers finally breach the classroom door and kill the shooter. Whoever leaked that video, I pray that you never, never have to deal with what all the parents, the grandparents, the siblings, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins are dealing with. The stunning public leak of the recording has forced families of the victims to relive the horror of that day. 
A glimpse into the horrific final moments of 19 children and two teachers. The way that video was released today is one of the most chicken things I've ever seen. The mayor of Uvalde lashed out at the leak and promptly faced backlash at a public meeting over his police department's response that day. It's like PTSD. You see him and you just want to go after him. You know, anger, rage. They're just cowards. You need to resign. The video does not bring closure or answers about whether quicker action could have saved lives. It only offers a horrific record of a modern American tragedy. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Sri Lanka's state of emergency ahead, the protests, political chaos, and a country in crisis. Watching Global National. To the growing chaos in Sri Lanka, sparked by a spiraling economic meltdown, a curfew and state of emergency has been declared after the country's president fled early this morning while protesters have now occupied the presidential palace and government offices. As Crystal Gamansing reports, Sri Lankans are pushing back against skyrocketing fuel and food prices and the calling for more leaders to step aside. Armed with grievances over their inability to afford food for their families or purchase fuel, demonstrators hit another government building in the Sri Lankan capital. The army and police use tear gas and water cannons to keep people out of the prime minister's office, but those tactics failed. These were not the usual protesters Sri Lanka sees. The, these were middle class people who just felt the brunt of it and felt something needed to be done. Economic unrest plagues the island nation in the Indian Ocean. The people blame the government for the mismanagement, and as citizens occupy and roam offices of the prime minister and the president, they say the opulence is infuriating. This is a great opportunity for people to see these buildings. It is only now they realize the luxurious lives they have paid with tax money. For the first time in the country's history, the president is in exile. Gotabaya Rajapakska fled on a military plane with his wife as calls for his resignation grew louder. The prime minister, now in charge, declared a state of emergency and imposed a curfew. He told the nation in crisis they must defeat this fascist threat. Demonstrations, however, are unlikely to stop until new elections are held. Without political stability, we're not going to be able to address the economic crisis and what is likely to be a humanitarian crisis very soon. Human rights lawyer Bhavani Vonseca says with so many people suffering, there are fears the mostly peaceful demonstrations could turn violent. Crystal Gamansen, Global News, London. During a raucous sitting of the UK House of Commons, outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson said he's leaving with his head held high. Make your mind up, and then shut up and get out! The Speaker ordered several lawmakers from the chamber as the weekly Prime Minister's question session got underway. Conservative lawmakers also narrowed the field of candidates looking to succeed Johnson as PM to six, with former Finance Minister Rishi Sunak topping the first round of voting. The new leader will be named on September 5th. Infamous failures next inside the museum dedicated to nothing but mega mistakes. So here is Bobby Jane. Hello, Bobby Jane. Toy maker Mattel has unveiled a Jane Goodall Barbie as part of its Inspiring Women series. The doll, wearing khaki shorts and binoculars and holding a notebook, is a nod to Goodall's conservation efforts as a primatologist and groundbreaking chimpanzee research. Girls 
don't want just to be film stars and things like that, but many of them, like me, want to be out in nature studying animals. The 88-year-old first started her research in 1960. She says this new Barbie fulfills a lifelong wish. On the road to success, failure is inevitable, and throughout history, there have been some doozies. So many, in fact, there is a museum in Sweden dedicated to some of the world's most famous flubs, and now that exhibit has come to Canada. So if you're in Calgary this summer, you can check out some of humanity's greatest innovation flops. But as Heather Urex west explains, it's not about highlighting failure, it's about learning and inspiring. Call it the best of the worst. The products that try to innovate but fell flat. New Coke, anyone? Innovation creates what, what the future will be. Um, and as part of that creation process, naturally, there will be times where there's going to be failure. Fascinated with flops, Swedish curator Samuel West decided to begin this collection. And the Museum of Failure was born. The traveling exhibit has now been all over the world, with its first Canadian stop here in Calgary. Remember these? Lawn darts, so dangerous they were eventually banned. Or this doll from 1965. Baby No Name was meant to teach kids compassion, but terrified them instead. A lot of these innovations push technology to its limits before actually uh, uh, being properly tested and properly uh, marketed. Some failures cost money and some became giant messes. Alestra was a, a widely marketed fat substitute that caused a lot of, um, I would call it gastrointestinal issues. Before stand-up or treadmill desks became popular, consumers could purchase this chair to work their core. For some reason though, it never caught on. But as Henry Ford said, the only real mistake is the one from which we learn nothing. And companies like Apple have clearly overcome missteps along the way. Oh, for, for sure. I mean, products that fail, um, uh, usually you can get better products out of it. It's a learning experience. So I'm a teacher. So I think, you know, it's something that I encourage my students and my kids to do all the time. And in this building full of blunders, big and small, that's kind of the point. The road to success is paved in failure one Colgate lasagna or Goopy Orbitz soda at a time. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. You never know unless you try. And that is Global National for this Wednesday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight's Your Canada is King's Throne Peak overlooking Kathleen Lake in Yukon's Kluwani National Park. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>